Hi, this is Emrys. And this is Luthien. And, and we're girls with sabers. We <laughs> are girls with sabers. That's all right. Woo! <laughs> Woo! <laughs> this is how the whole podcast is going to go. It's just going to be a whole lot of talking over each other. I find that the most fun. Yeah. Yes. That's how um, we... Oh, I forgot to preface. I have an hour and a half. I thought you were going to say you have never seen Star Wars. And I'm just... <laughs> that too. Also... Uh, at at chat is Ray's dad. Ah, uh, <laughs> you know what? That's a great way to start it because we're gonna start it with Ray's dad, not exactly her dad, but you two, uh, you two are all across the board on YouTube. Everyone knows you on YouTube. You are big YouTube celebrities. You go to conventions oh, and you sign papers. It. But you, you are you're you're big players on YouTube, and you have an awesome channel, a Patreon page, all that oh. great support. You have some of the best supporters. I try to steal your supporters over at Rebel Scum. I'm like, we no, need it's to. Sharing. We go. No, it's I. Not stealing. No, no, I actually. Sharing. I steal. Oh, you poach. I, You're poaching? Yeah, I'm definitely poaching. Like this I am. This is awkward. <laughs> but you have some <laughs> like loyal supporters to a T, and it's yes, it's great. We do. But you two have a very interesting story, a very intriguing story to me about how this channel came to be. Can you both just walk me through the beginnings of Girls with Sabers? M. Well, <laughs> uh, <laughs> we met on a channel, just a tiny little unknown channel called Den of Nerds. <laughs> yeah. So, um, we uh, were are both very passionate about Raylo, and basically, she would write something, and I would write something, and it would be exactly the same comment with exactly the same sentence structure <laughs> it was mm. that it was that bizarre so, so much, much so yeah that josh confused <laughs> us with us we were like the twins that he couldn't tell apart even just with our sentences and our thoughts so we started talking on instagram and um we couldn't stop talking about star wars how much we loved it how we how much we loved raylo and just wanted to start sharing our conversations because we just had a blast discussing it. So uh, I asked her if she wanted to join me with on a channel called Girls with Sabers, and thankfully she accepted, and here we are today. <laughs> I think my exact words were, I'll do whatever you want me to do. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> yeah. If we looked back in our messages, that's exactly what it would have said. I am down. Yes. Whatever you yes. want me to do, I'll do it. Yes. What, so was that just the, the, that was just it. It was just, we want to do this channel and let's just talk Raylo. Was that, is that just it? It wasn't just Raylo. Raylo was our connection as, as fangirls. But as we discussed and, and, and became more familiar with each other's interests, we found out that we love the same literature, the same movies, the same um, music. It was just, we feel like we were sisters, twins, that we never actually met in person. So Girls with Sabres, of course, started as Raylo, but just as Raylo itself extends and refers to other things, our channel will continue to grow in its, its content and what we discuss. That's and this is why I wanted to do this Outlander Club podcast to talk to to a lot of people and you two included because of Star Wars fandom and how incredible it is. When, yeah. And you've never met, we've never met, but no. you two could just get together and say, hey, let's do a YouTube channel and we'll do videos all the time and uh, because we love the same things and we're going to do it. And it's incredible to me how it works out because, you know, you do see a lot of, a lot of, um, there's some mean spirited members of, yes. I don't even know if they're part of the fandom, but they are out there, but there's this other side to it. That is just amazing. And, and no, but not a lot of people get to witness that. Mm -hmm. No, that's so, it's so true. Uh, when M approached me, it was really at that point in the fandom where it was just a flaming chasm and yes. I mean, like, every other video on YouTube was, like, the world's biggest hot take. And 
we just wanted to instill positivity back in the fandom. And yeah. whether you liked Raylo or not, obviously a lot of our videos are centered around um, bringing it to light and making the case for it, basically. Mm-hmm. And But we wanted to do more, not just Raylo, but Star Wars in general for the, the people who truly loved and love the sequel trilogy, especially uh, a place for them to go. It, it got so clicky as well. And both Emrys and I were finding that even if you weren't like in the, the anti or hater faction popping on over to other content creators even in the comment section, the comment sections were brutal. And I oh mean, my like, goodness. egregiously yes. just, it's a wasteland of f- filth and scum and villainy, <laughs> scum and for villainy. lack of better terms. So, but, you know, oh, I really love Star Wars. Well, when did you start liking Star Wars? Uh, did you were you even alive during the original trilogy? Because I was alive during the original trilogy. Well, I just got into it because of the sequel trilogy, and I'm just like giving a generalization. I got into it because of the sequel trilogy, and I really really like that. Oh well, we don't consider the sequel trilogy canon over here. I was <laughs> like, what do you mean? It's Star Wars. It's not my Star Wars. I mean, so we just wanted a channel where people could come and say whatever they liked about it, but do it in a positive way. Do it in a constructive way. You can criticize, but don't slander. Don't just throw your hate around. And M completely let me take over that block button. Mm -hmm. And I have gone, I haven't gone crazy, but I don't really allow people to just spew their hate. That's not constructive. And no matter what people post, I we both want them to feel a part of this community. And, you know, our one year anniversary of the channel is coming up. And we could never have imagined being at the point we are now in within a year. And and the community that's that we are now a part of rebel scum at at chat denna nerds um do back discussion i mean so many other channels we have all kind of rallied together and it's the camaraderie the camaraderie and the fellowship is just amazing and we i i consider all you guys friends now you know interweb friends basically even though we've never (laughs) met and it's just such a fun fun community now I think we're all trying to drown out the hate and focus on what we all love yeah and you know what for me and I think what you're saying is you might agree with this is it hasn't even been a struggle to drown out the negativity it's just kind of no, it's it just kind not. of happened. Yeah, they yes. gravitate to you because you're positive in what you're talking about, and because you just you like it and you you're mm-hmm. passionate about it, yes. and they can, and people can see that, and the haters are just going to ignore it because it's possible because they understand that oh if I step into that arena right. I'm going to be taken out. So it's uh, mm-hmm. it is it's great like that. But now I want both of you to prove your Star Wars fandom to me. <laughs> uh, How could oh. you? You are not true fans. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. I want to go back though. Oh, to- good. I just got the shakes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. At the 17 minute mark of Attack of the Clones, what does Obi Wan? Con- I'm just joking. I don't. Know. I don't remember because I probably didn't like it. You probably did. It. I want to talk about that, but first I want to talk about. <laughs> I want you you both to talk about your very first experiences with with Star Wars. So, Emerson, I'll start with you uh, because you have a really cool one. So, what was your very first introduction to the galaxy far, far away? Vader space above my crib. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that's above your crib. What a way to come into this world. Um. My dad worked for a company which sold the build-it-yourself models for all of the ships. 
in the Star Wars galaxy, and he started doing that in the late 70s, all through the 80s and 90s. So he went through to a lot of the the conventions and the trade shows and things of that nature, and he met David Prowse. And so uh, he had a daughter that was just born, me, and so David Prowse wrote, you know, may the force be with you and my name. And then my dad decided to put me, put the poster, not me, the poster above my crib wall. So I saw Vader uh, <laughs> over my crib every single night. And that's probably why I like Kylo Ren. <laughs> <laughs> that is the coolest story. That, oh man, I just, you just, like everybody has that dream of Vader above their crib growing up. Yes. With Prowse yes. writing your name <laughs> in bright lights. Luthien, how about you? Um, mine isn't as awesome. Uh, but <laughs> my mom got me and my sister into Star Wars. And I just think that's awesome. She my uh my brother had taken her to see to see it when they re-released and this was probably the early 80s and I think right before um uh well in the in the couple years after um Return of the Jedi came out sorry like all the titles are like flopping through my head so I have to like pick the right one here um after Return of the Jedi came out I think they re-released a lot of like all three of the films in theaters and they ran for a long time at least in in our town. So my brother took my mom and she always remembered that. And she thought it was so cool. You know, the um, star destroyer coming over the top in a new hope. And she's like, you know what, you know, he loves this and I'll, you know, I'm kind of into it. It's really good. So when my sister and I were, I don't know, seven or eight, I remember going to the video store and, and yeah, I dated myself cause those still existed. And we picked it out and I remember the cover of it was the old school like Luke bare chested like the the shirt opening up Leia at his hip like you know just insanely like (laughs) Hanna-Barbera-esque and (laughs) like I also remember looking at that cover and then watching A New Hope I'm like even at seven or eight I remember thinking Luke's not that built (laughs) but anyway (laughs) um but we, we watched it, put put in the VHS, and and I fell in love with it. I'm like, this is amazing. Fell in love with Han Solo. Even, even in A New Hope, I always wanted Han and Leia to be together. Even though I had no idea that Luke and Leia were brother and sister and yada, 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 I always wanted them to be together. And I knew my brother liked Star Wars. He had all the toys, and then they sold them in the rummage sale because they didn't know... <laughs> They were gonna be, oh yeah, gonna be worth something. I'm like, oh my god, how many kids' parents did that? Like, just chucked them in a rummage yes. sale and it was like five dollar box. Mine. It's like, oh my, oh my god, it hurts. Yeah, it definitely. My definitely uh, my mom tore my poster down and threw it in the trash. The Darth Vader so one. I do not have it, and no. it. Oh it my wounded, God. yeah, it wounded my dad. It's like a because... million souls just cried out. <laughs> exactly, exactly. In fact, when my family gathers for Christmas every year, that is the story that we tell. <laughs> but anyway, so my brother, I was excited that I could finally talk to my brother about Star Wars. And then when I got to school and my guy friends... Uh, you know, we're talking about Star Wars and stuff. I was able to talk to them about it. Um, and then they took out the Star Wars playing cards and magic cards or whatever. And I'm like, nope, <laughs> don't care. <laughs> but uh, it was something I could relate to with them. So that was that was fun. But I'll never forget sitting on the living room floor, looking up at my TV, watching Star Wars and just being enraptured. Mm-hmm. It was awesome. All thanks to my mom. <laughs> it's a good mom right there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sit down and watch this. You're going to like it. But what if I yeah. don't? You will. Like, we had no choice. Exactly. That's yeah. how it was. I'm pretty sure I grew up just, they would leave me as a baby and just put me on the couch. Be like, we're leaving for the night and play Star Wars. And they'd come back after three movies. I'd be like, you still watching it? And I'd be asleep. Or I don't know. I don't know. I just, I, growing up, it was just always part of my, my life. I don't, 
I don't know life without Star Wars. Yeah. It's I, nope. But I, you were just talking about the toys and giving away the toys, and that happened to me, as I said. You know, my parents gave, I think, my Millennium Falcon, my Ewok Village, my Tauntauns, all my toys to charity. I was able to save a couple Hans, a few Landos, mm-hmm. uh, and a Stormtrooper that is now yellow. But I don't have any more. Neither one of you had great experiences with toys, however. No. And this is going to go into, I want to go into another topic with this, but Emerson, I want to hear your story about your toy experience first before we delve a little deeper into this. I grew up in an atmosphere that really didn't encourage girls playing with boys' toys. Now, if I really, if I really begged for it, maybe I would have received it, but I would always get a very puzzled look of where is this going and why do you want it? <laughs> uh, so I had my, my godmother had two sons who were obsessed with star Wars. And so she still has a closet full of star Wars toys from the seventies and the eighties in their original box. I mean, oh just like God, shelves me. full of it. Um, and she still won't let me in there. I think she's suspicious. <laughs> oh but, not that I'm a thief, but I think she would just be like, I, I'm, I am scared or you'll have to be under supervision. Well, uh, so were the boys, I guess, because they were always scared that I was going to touch one of the action figures or the models because they had elaborate sets in their basement. Well, going down the basement, the first thing you would see is a huge Jaws poster. And so you would open the basement door and then there would be a spotlight behind you and the spotlight would just go right down the mouth of the shark. (laughs) And I would be (laughs) scared to death to walk down there, even though there was Star Wars toys. (laughs) And I have no doubt that uh, those two boys put that Jaws poster up to derail me from going down there and touching any of the figurines that they so elaborately arranged. So that's my sad story. (laughs) I wanted to, but I wasn't allowed to. But I was much younger. I was a toddler um, in third, fourth, fifth grade, and they were still playing with it. But they wouldn't let me, wouldn't let me touch it. They wouldn't let you. And this is what I wanted to get into now. Yeah. Something that I think we should touch on. Because when I was a kid, obviously, (laughs) like I said, I had all the Star Wars toys, but I had two younger sisters uh, one was way too young to care about Star Wars at the time. The other one, though, was only a few years younger than me, and she would, she never had these cool toys. Like, she would always have to get, I said this before, Janine from Ghostbusters or, yes. or like, April O'Neil, who yep. I guess now they've kind of made her kind of cool. But, you know, back then she just was a reporter. And, mm-hmm. then, and then she'd be like, well, I guess I'll be Leonardo. And she'd slowly, she'd have to, you know, take on these male characters, <laughs> even though, you know, she wanted the strong ones. So when... Uh, jumping ahead when force awakens came out she was so excited about ray about this right. female jedi she was so excited and that was for me you know as as a male and i, I don't know what it maybe it's ignorance i don't know i never thought of it like i had no problem with ray being a female jedi i just never thought of how important it was to the female audience mm. for whatever reason so i want I want to hear you guys talk about this now because you grew up and you weren't even allowed to play with the toys so, no. so, <laughs> But I, I want to know the perspective now from the from the early on to now of the female side of fandom uh, from your point of view. If I had any knowledge of a female Jedi, I would have taken to that hardcore. But since I didn't have that, not that I didn't love Star Wars and... and um, you know, I just never had the inclination to get toys. I had other stuff to play with or, um, you know, video games were huge. I mean, Nintendo was huge. So, like, there was all this other kind of video game consoles, Game Boy, and then, you know, rolling onto that. And then all of a sudden this crazy-ass game, Mortal Kombat, came out. And we were banned from playing it, but we went over to my friend's house and played it anyway. And I, like, loved Sonya Blade. And so I had other stuff to occupy my mind. But if – so I did not get into Star Wars toys. But I have a feeling that if there was a a female Jedi out there, um, I think I would have gravitated to that. Just like I gravitated to Sonya Blade and, 
you know, uh, Lara Croft and, and all these things. And not that Leia wasn't badass in her own right, but Leia was all we had. And we didn't even know she had the Force until the last movie. And even then, we didn't see anything really of that except her kind of feeling uh, feeling the truth that Luke was her brother. Right. Um, and that he made it off the, the Death Star alive. So I think it's so, so important for things to be relatable. And I think that's what's so beautiful about Ray. And we said it in our last podcast, Emma said it beautifully. Um, that one man who isn't a fan of the sequel trilogy. And he really didn't like where Luke's character went, felt like when, Luke felt depressed and exiled him. He felt like that was happening to him because this was Luke Skywalker, the the young man he grew up with, grew up idolizing. But then sitting next to him is this young girl. And every time Ray was, Ray was, was on screen, the girl sat up straight, was really focused, like so excited. And he goes, this movie wasn't for me. It was for her. And that's so powerful. And, I don't like using buzzwords like representation and diversity and, and things of that nature, but uh, cause I feel they're just used so much. I, I do feel that Ray came along at such an important time where young girls needed someone to relate to and she was it. It's just, I I love it. I love it. And I and I love seeing even my nephew. He's so excited. We I just, uh, this past Christmas, showed him the original trilogy. And it was so, so awesome. And now he's so jonesing to watch, <laughs> to watch the sequel trilogy. And he loves Kylo Ren. But he also loves Rey. And I just, there, not only is she, re- she relatable to 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 young girls and to the female part of the fandom there are plenty of guys and young boys out there and i mean for plethora of different reasons but there are young boys out there who love ray because she's a strong character period end of sentence not just you know she's not a male character but they love her for the character that she is so it's it's great i think she is so she is such the the female journey. Mm-hmm. And when I say that, I don't mean a feminist journey, although people would would say that. But for me, she really represents women of this generation of being told you have to be a warrior. You have to put on a strong face. You have to do this and you have to survive. But it's very much a, a facade she wears. If you really look at the character of Ray, um, some of that smile, some of that uh, strong strength that she has is basically trying to hide a very vulnerable, very sad and uh, broken girl. And she does not show that to anybody except for Kylo Ren. And the reason she does is he will not stop until he gets her to tell the truth, to speak the truth, to let her um, admit that vulnerability and that hurt and that pain. Mm-hmm. Because basically, uh, that's what girls are told, to not, you know, don't let anyone see that you need anyone, that you just, you can fight and you can pull through it, which is a important lesson. But in some ways, I think uh, the generations of my my mom, uh, you can have it all, has been founded to be untrue. And that not only are you a warrior woman, but femininity is not against <laughs> feminism. I mean, mm-hmm. you can be a feminine woman and still be strong and still be vulnerable, but just just having that ability to to know that you're loved and you belong and you have identity. Like when people say, 
how did she get all this power? Or how does she, she is so strong. I just want to say, but she isn't. You see the force and, and the force has enabled her with this power, but that's not her journey. She wasn't like Luke. She didn't stare into the horizon and wanted to be a Jedi like her father. Um, she wants, she keeps on saying, I want to belong. I want someone to show me my place in all of this. And that's really a girl's quest is to find her identity. And if you look at all the female literature out there, Alice in mm. Wonderland, Secret Garden, I mean, all of that is about girls finding out where do I belong in this world, especially the modern world, mm-hmm. because it's so it's so ambiguous. Do I belong in the queer world? Do I belong in the domestic world? Or do I belong in both? And at what what percentage? It's just, it's confusing. And it's bizarre. And I think that's why The Last Jedi and that female journey just puzzled so many people. Mm-hmm. Because at the first time, you're seeing the world, the star, the galaxy far, far away from truly a female's perspective. How was your reactions to The Last Jedi, not the movie itself, but the criticisms that it got about the, uh, which I didn't even know that this was a term, but the SJW agenda. Uh. <laughs> Good, so same as mine. <laughs> but I actually had never heard of that term before that, mo- before that movie, and I unfortunately did after. But I just, I just want to know, because everything you just said is leading me to... There's two questions I have for you, but this one I want to start mm. with is, is what was your, other than, uh, <laughs> what was your first reaction to the, those negative comments? Do you want, Luthien, do you want to answer this? Oh, I, Keep I this will. Keep this G-rated, please. G-rated. I will. That's- I will. Um, I'm going to be honest. My initial, first of all, it's a two-parter. My initial viewing of The Last Jedi, I... I wasn't in awe of it. And given everything that was going on in the real world, I felt that it was trying to mirror that a little too much. And I'm like, you know what? I And not that Star Wars has never done that, but I wanted to come in. I wanted to watch Star Wars. And I didn't want to see uh, Laura Dern with purple hair And I mean, so I wanted an escape and I felt like Star Wars was always an escape for me. And I couldn't go into this film and escape what was going on outside. So I left. I loved all the Raylo scenes. Avi. And (laughs) um, I, I, but some other things I just felt were horribly written. And that's when... I found the Den of Nerds and watching Josh's channel um, and and James, you were on Josh's channel at that time, you know, doing live streams and stuff and just uh, guest podcasts. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to see it again. I'm going to see it again. The way you guys were talking. And of course you're talking about Raylo stuff and so I saw it again, and I I went in. I'm like, okay, I'm not going to like the character of Rose. I, I like her, but I don't like how she was written. So I had to be a little bit more objective and go in, be like, okay, what do I like about this film? Not, not what I don't like. Don't concentrate on that. Concentrate on what I like. So I went in, and I watched it again. And my mind was just blown. I was seeing things that I did not see on my first viewing and it just, I saw everything was coming at me. Um, and I left the theater going, Ryan Johnson, you are a flipping genius, man. Like, (laughs) and you, and I left again going, you are going to be underappreciated. And sure enough, I get on the interwebs and it's just mass chaos. Um, there's the the hate just to be hateful and the certain channels that are clickbaity and are just riding that train just I mean they probably don't even hate the film like they're probably closet Raylo shippers I mean but they're doing it for clicks 
But then you have the people who are, and again, it's just, it's insanity how there are different factions of like and dislike. It's nuts. Um, There are fans who loved it, but still feel like Ryan Johnson completely ruined it, which is like an oxymoron. Then you, it just blew my mind. But thank, thank God I met Emrys because we just kind of worked through our feelings. And um, I, I can see where much of the fandom is coming from when they felt that too much of what was going on outside was put into this film. That's what a lot of people said. Even James, I think I remember you and Josh even said this in a live stream where everyone wanted to escape. Everyone wanted to escape what was going on politically and uh, socially and they couldn't because they walked into Star Wars and it was right in front of them. So a lot of people got upset by that. I can understand that because technically I was a little bit of that. But some of these oh, people sure. can't. That's okay. Some of these people cannot let that go like I did and go into a second or third viewing and just take a big sigh and go, okay, what do I like about this film? And boom, there it is. Uh it's just, it's, I wish people could do that like I did. I think they also need to stick, you know, take a side back and actually look at the big picture. Yes. And ask themselves, what are the themes of this movie? Mm-hmm. Put, put labels aside, like social justice warrior and everything, emasculation, misogyny, all those buzz words, mm-hmm. and say, okay, why is this here? I'm not going because every every Star Wars movie, every time has had a political viewpoint of current politics inserted yes. in. I mean, to say why is this happening now is to not is just ignore the past and what George Lucas weaved the politics and his worldview into the prequels and the original trilogy. But there's a reason, and the reason is. It's, it is really much of a reflection of what's going on. But what is it saying about that? To me, the emasculation, the misogyny, the, um, the, the like discord between Hux and, I mean, not Hux, and Poe and Holdo and, and Rose and Finn are all about the relationships, the broken relationships between men and women when they don't work together, when they don't listen to each other. And the most wonderful <laughs> scene of the entire movie, in my opinion, is the scene where the when Kylo and Ray do work together. I mean, they were able to take down the Supreme Leader of the First Order. I mean, it it's just, that is the theme. Yes, there's there is emasculation. Yes, there's misogyny. And yes, it should offend you because it's trying to say, why is it wrong? What happens when we don't listen to each other and don't work in collaboration? Why is there such this this weirdness about gender politics? And I think that's what I think that's what The Last Jedi was talking about. Look at it thematically instead of. Um, what is why is there political agendas in here? Because there have always been. You just were too young <laughs> to mm-hmm. realize realize it. It really took M saying that to me, legit saying this is about men and women not working together and the result of that and the Poe and the Holdo and the Finn and the Rose and finally. Ben and Ray working together and that being the end goal. Um, It literally took her saying that to me to go, Oh my God, duh. Like, why didn't I, why didn't I see that? And then going back into it, watching it, I had a, I had a better respect for how those scenes played out. Um, 
even though some of the dialogue I still didn't care for, but I could respect the scenes better for what they were and what the the whole the the whole story being told here. And that is a and when I say that, I'm not trying to say it's a perfect movie. Right. There are there are definite flaws that I mm-hmm. wish were fixed and character development that was overlooked and there are things that I wish um, were different but even like the eyesore that is Holdo was meant to show femininity at its extreme and that extreme being a leader I mean that's why she has the purple hair and the Grecian goddess Mm -hmm. dress and stuff is she's trying to be almost off-putting of how uh how feminine and so you know severe femininity is almost mm-hmm. like garishness yes, of, yes. like an effie that's a really like, good term for it, hun- garish or hu- you know hunger games <laughs> yeah <laughs> that kind of character and then you're like uh you're trying to lead the the you know the resistance looking like that um so it, it's it's all these complaints some of these complaints of sjw and things of that nature are woven in to start having people discuss them instead of having it um, pushed down your throat. It's all about how you receive it and how you digest it. Um, And I think that is part of the problem. Instead of complaining of why is this there here, ask yourself what, why, why did they make these decisions other than just a political agenda? Because I'm very sensitive to that kind of thing. Like if you're just if you're just going to uh, put this character in without a role, without an agency for that character, then it's it feels forced instead of true. Mm-hmm. That's a fantastic way. That's eye opening <laughs> for me. Yeah. yeah, I I personally like Holdo to be honest. Um, and whenever somebody throws the sjw at me i'm like well i mean it's the same character if it's male or female to me but you've just changed my opinion and everything right there so there <laughs> go. i have the, the second part to what i wanted to ask you though is you, you we're talking about ray and all these female characters now and, and in force wagons it's ray's the female hero journey but both that uh and the last jedi and now rise of skywalker have been written by men how do you how do you both accept that perceive that and and are you like do you feel it would they be better represented with a female writer or are you okay with jj abrams ryan johnson and company taking the reins on this i don't i don't care as well as she has agency and she's a well-developed character i'm sure people would i mean i wouldn't be offended or i like i would not I don't care as long as it's done well, (laughs) if that makes sense. Like I would love for some female directors and female writers to actually hold the reins. But to me, the product is more important than the, the name that is on the, the film. I, I agree with that. Um, Do I feel like, It's so it's so difficult to word this because I I certainly would love to see more female directors out there, yeah. more female uh, representation in film. Period. That being said, I feel like the best person for the job is is someone who it's so hard to word this look who is at the helm Kathy K who did Kathy K pick she picked JJ Abrams she picked Ryan Johnson did she pick Colin Trevorrow and went, oh, dang, I messed up. I got to go back to JJ? Possibly. 
but she's picking directors with the chops and the experience to handle something like this. And I'm not saying that a woman director could never handle something like this. No, but look at all that JJ has done leading up to star Wars, all the star Trek films, super eight, the things he's produced, the things he's directed. He's very experienced in this genre and just with a, a mass production period. The same with Colin Trevorrow the, and Ryan Johnson. I mean, uh, some people have forgotten that he's done Looper. I mean, that is kind of like a cult hit now. And you look at that and you're like, God, that just blew my mind. And you can't just watch it once and be blown away. That's a movie you have to watch at least like three times, in my opinion. So these directors are being handpicked and... I feel that they pick the best people for the job. Like Emma said, as long as the characters have agency, as long as Ray has agency, then let it be the best person for the job. And that's not to say female directors and writers are, you know, that they don't get stonewalled. They certainly do. They yes. certainly get shoved to the 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 back of the line, so to speak. But I and, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I I'm just fumbling. Wanna, I, I, I want to. I'm sorry. <laughs> I I just want to clarify that when I said that, I didn't mean that there should there should be more female directors and writers. I mean that 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 should just be the norm. <laughs> but to me. As long, yeah, I just, I feel like there, those are two different questions, if that makes sense. Like, to me, do you mind if a man wrote a female character? No. <laughs> do you mind if a, a man directed a female-oriented movie? No. Do you mind that a female directed a, a male-oriented uh, movie? No. To me, it's more about we need to change the way that... Uh, directors and writers are chosen and I think they're chosen by who is the best person for the job instead of Hollywood politics and who knows who and this is one thing that I would love to say in a, in a stream and I never have I'm not a huge fan of Kathleen Kennedy there's some things that she has done in the Star Wars that I'm just kind of like hmm but I wish people would look at her history and the 30 years yes, of producing that. films that she has made. I mean, she she was a producer for the Goonies. <laughs> pick that, pick any awesome 80s film. She 90s, probably produced it. 2000s. 80s and 90s. 2000s. Yes, I yes. mean, Kathleen Kennedy knows what she's doing when it comes to producing. And whether, regardless of whether you think she's the best for Lucasfilm, Kathleen Kennedy picked these directors. And I trust that. So if she chose a man to direct, not only direct these films, but to write them, I trust her. Yeah. I mean, if she's a feminist, everyone says she is, then wouldn't she have just given all the directors and writers, like the whole uh, film created to creativity would be run by women. It wasn't. And I, I think, again, that's female and male collaboration. Like it should always be. And yes, that's a utopian mm -hmm. <laughs> idea, but she wanted to work with people that she was harmonious with. And she should be free to do so while she runs the helm. Anything um, I would have done, anything Emerus would have done, I mean, we're certainly not directors, but if I were a female director, I would hate to have the knowledge of, did I get this because I'm a female? Yes. Did they need to pick a female director and this is why I got it? Like, so am I, did they pick me because of my chops? Or did they pick me because of my gender and to uh, 
so they wouldn't get called out upon. Yeah, you know, just delete everything I said previously. Just use that, James. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, sure. sure. Well, th- this is the thing too is with J.J. J. Abrams and and I would d- guess Ryan Johnson is J.J. J. Abrams has always, for as long as he's been in the spotlight, he said he's a Star Wars fan. He's been a fan his whole life of Star Wars. Mm-hmm. Now, to your points earlier, he would have grown up with those movies, and it would have been acceptable for him to love those movies because he was a male. Whereas you just pointed out how females had a little bit of a different route going into it. Now, I'm not saying not, they, none of them like Star Wars or whatever. But maybe now with these new, with Ray and whatnot, these young girls now who are going to grow up to become filmmakers will be the next J.J. Abrams themselves. And then that is how you, yes. that's how it becomes like that. Instead of just picking a female for the sake of picking a female to helm a Star right, Wars film, you right, pick someone as passionate right. as J.J. Abrams. Mm-hmm. And now they're given that opportunity because of these films to become that. Yes. Yes. It's, it's a shame that it's been that it's taken this long for female directors to finally like come into their own, come into the light. Uh, Most had to either, you know, get the backing from a production company or create their own production companies to get their films out there. But it's becoming easier and easier, especially with the dichotomy of Hollywood changing now. So I would love it to see strong female directors and writers take the helm of fantasy and sci-fi. Um, I think there are brilliant stories to be told there, but I would, I would never say, well, Star Wars needs more female writers because it needs female writers. Or no. Star Wars needs more female directors because it needs female directors. No, they need the right people for the job, period. People for the job. And I'll be fine as as long as it's written well. Mm-hmm. Um, there are plenty of authors out there, male and female. Um, male authors writing women beautifully. Like, it just clicks. They get it. And you can say the same thing about female writers who have written the a male character just brilliantly. Um, so I, I think JJ and Ryan have done a brilliant job with these characters. You can tell Ryan was rushed with the character of Rose. And it's that's a shame. I hope JJ takes that... Uh, foundation of Rose and kind of brings it um, and develops it more. I did not... uh, The backlash with Rose was such a shame and it's horrific that the actress herself got pulled into that. But you can tell Ryan was rushed with her. And it's it's a shame. But he did a very good job with some of the other characters I felt. And my favorite was Kylo Ren and Luke. Um, And the way he was able to pull it, it's, it speaks volumes about a director period, male or female. If you can get the type of performances you got from Carrie Fisher, Mark Hamill, Adam driver and Daisy Ridley in the last Jedi. Is absolutely phenomenal. The man deserves way more credit than he's than he's gotten. I also think it's he he bit off more than he could chew. I I uh, agree. That's why Jason Fry wrote the expanded edition. Yep. Because uh, he, I mean, even in the the commentary and the bonus features, he talks about how here are the deleted scenes because I wrote too much movie. <laughs> I wrote too much of a movie, and so we had to cut it down substantially. So I think with the character of Rose, especially, that was that was so cut down to where it lost 
the character's uh, Mm -hmm. empathy. You lost empathy for Rose. Like, you had that one or two scenes with the necklace Mm -hmm. to connect Paige and Rose, but you really didn't see the sisters ever bond. And I think it just would have been... It would have been a different matter if we saw where Rose came from when she when she met Finn. Um, more than just crying in the corner, but to see how important her sister was and why her sister was so important. Because there's a whole story there that was never told. There's only so much time, too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and that's the thing. Without the... That is one of the novelizations that I consider to be, I, it like, not more than a novelization. It's almost like a separate novel yeah. in itself, like mm-hmm. a different story. It's got so much extra in there. Every, yeah. every Star Wars fan should check it out if they haven't. Mm-hmm. Yes. All right, let's rewind before the sequel trilogy now, because you're both huge fans of the prequels. <laughs> So, so no, neither one of you are, are massive fans of the prequels. But I have to ask you, when The Phantom Menace came out, and I know the answer, obviously, but I have to ask you, when The Phantom Menace came out, what was your excitement level at? Can we what go in the negative, negative digits? You definitely go in the negative because... This, okay. Yeah. Um, for me, I was... God. Let me even... What was that, 1999? 99. Yeah. So I was a teenager. And at that point, I was really not in the Star Wars at all. Um, I had just found out that uh, The Lord of the Rings was being made into a movie series. Yes. And... <laughs> After that, (laughs) I just went off in a high fantasy direction and Star Wars fell to the wayside. So I didn't, and The Phantom Menace is the only Star Wars film I have not seen in theaters. My mom and I rented it and we both proceeded to fall asleep. Um, I woke up for the pod race, promptly fell back to sleep, woke up again and Qui Gon uh, died at the, at the hands of yeah <laughs> at the hands of Maul. So I I still I've seen the whole thing. I have not seen it from start to finish. Um, because something always happens where I'm distracted or something. But again, this for what people how people feel about the sequel trilogy is how I feel about the prequels. Don't get me wrong. I love a good prequel meme. And I think I'm more deep into the memes than I'm in the actual movies, <laughs> which makes me appreciate the movies all that more. Cause now I watch them. And I'm like, Oh, that's the meme. Oh, that's a meme. Oh, that's a meme. And I, but I'm like how people are with the sequel trilogy. The prequels were not for me. The prequels were for the younger kids now needing someone to watch. And it was a young Anakin, especially in The Phantom Menace. Um, so I I love the part of the fandom that loves the prequel trilogies. Or the tr- prequel trilogy. I really, I really do. I just and I and I look at it as the story as a whole. Um, that's how I'm able to enjoy them. Um, but I had to rewatch Attack of the Clones, which I had only seen once. <laughs> for I did a live stream with Adat Chat, and we were talking Attack of the Clones, so I rewatched it and. I'm like, yep, still don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> but I was watching it now more with a more analytical mind because of, you know, how we feel Raylo is reverse Anadala and 
I was watching this and I was watching that and taking notes and I had to discuss it. So I definitely went into it with a, a different mind. Um, the thing I always gravitated to with all Star Wars films uh, and definitely the, the prequels for sure is the music. That and the art direction, the cinematography, even though I, I feel like pr- the prequels went ape crazy, um, too much so for their, their own good. But the music is what captured me. I mean, Duel of the Fates, like, crank that up to 11. I mean, yeah. it, was so, it was so good. And, and Across the Stars, I mean, just John Williams is a freaking master. And you have people claiming that he, you know, pilfers all his stuff. But I'm like, uh, then you don't really know uh, music. <laughs> because every classical composer was a student of another and uh, just completely took motifs and went with that. Like, talk about Bach and his kids. <laughs> I mean, they all freaking sound the same. I'm like, shoot, is that uh, Johann Sebastian Bach? Or is that uh, uh, Johann Christian Bach? Or is that uh, his kid? Like, they all sound the same. But the same with any composer and his contemporaries or contemporary they're gonna it's gonna sound they're they're good it's more inspiration than stealing stealing is a horrible word when it comes to uh soundtracks classical music in general Mm -hmm. it's all inspiration unless you're seriously just like pilfering a whole movement (laughs) <laughs> from something or a whole measure, but it they're more nods. They're more fanfares of of I loved this so much. I mean, you listen to John Williams, he sounds like Wagner, he sounds like everything else. But I'm going on a tangent here. But the music pulled me in and I can certainly appreciate the prequels for what they are. And what they mean to a lot of people. I was ecstatic to see the Phantom Menace. I we I was waiting for this movie for a prequel, I think for about 10 years before it came out because I had a friend who uh, would watch it like a hawk and would tell me all of the little tidbits of news that she would get because I, I didn't have access to the, a computer or the internet except at school at that time. And she would watch everything. So I was so excited. And I went into that movie theater. And I still, my favorite memory is hearing that that THX. Yeah. And then um, the, the fanfare coming on and actually seeing that, that scrolling credit just like, come at you (laughs) because I already I only saw it and heard it on a little tiny tv screen and that was my first experience where it was it just filled the entire room and it was electric I know people overuse that but for me it was I had goosebumps like crazy I was tearing up because I just felt like I entered my childhood once more and I was about to see something incredible and beautiful and actually see how uh, this little boy turned into Vader. And I think it was like halfway through the movie, um, especially when Jar Jar Binks showed up, I was a little scared and then I became more and more scared and I was like, this is not good. And I was like, don't, don't listen to yourself. Don't listen to yourself, Immers. You like this. It's Star Wars. <laughs> And I would continue to watch and, you know, deny, like, try to lock up that negative feeling. And I just couldn't. And I went back to see it uh, with some more friends. And I just never, I still can't get to the point where I love this movie. Now, I like certain aspects of it. Um, When I saw it in theaters, I thought the Duel of the Fates was the best thing ever. (laughs) I loved Anakin's theme, um, and of course the the music was wonderful. 
And I love the costumes. I was very uh, into the costumes and researching all of the the nationalities that they pulled from to especially make Padme's and Amidala, Padme Amidala's costume. So it was just more, it was more being heart sick than it was being vile towards these movies. I, I, I still love Star Wars and I never want it to end, nor did I want uh, George Lucas to pay a horrible a price and be locked up in fan gel for the rest of his life. I just, it, it was more grief than anything because it didn't live up. And what my, my favorite memory of the Phantom Menace or even that, it, the prequels of seeing all three in the theater was seeing the opening crawl and then the rest just died. <laughs> Just Sorry. Die. Well, <laughs> that's what it was. <laughs> but that's the thing is, it's the expectations right. come into yes. all of these movies, and yeah, we'll get into too. we'll get into your expectations yeah. for the sequels in a second. Yes. Uh, so, Attack of the Clones, we're not even going to talk about because you both saw it, and I think <laughs> you know we do every January first on the channel. Next year, we'll have you you a part of this as we rank Star Wars. So we give it one to ten. Next year will be one to eleven. And we just, all, we have all of us just put in our rankings, and I do the math, and I add them together. And Attack of the Clones is always at the very bottom. And I actually am starting to feel bad for the movie. So mm-hmm. I'm trying to put it as my number one, but it still cannot get enough to, to move past that. Mm-hmm. It just can't. So I don't even want to talk about Attack of the Clones because a lot of people have the same feelings about it. Yeah. But Re- yeah. Revenge of the Sith. Uh, so Revenge of the Sith, no matter what – either of you think about it, Luthien, you had a, it has a connection with you that will last forever. Yes. Um, I remember skipping work, like playing hooky, calling in and going to see that with my boyfriend who is now my husband. And we actually met two of his friends at the theater and uh, we went to see it and it was the ultra screen and it was actually my first ultra screen movie so for those who don't know what an ultra screen is it's kind of like a little smaller version of an IMAX or um you know just a huge s huge s screen why are you looking at me like that the boyfriend just walked in (laughs) no you're my husband now don't look at me like that (laughs) just go so anyway ultra screen it was huge it was awesome and it was star wars and then you know you have that emrys feeling you know that she said of the the thx coming on you're just like oh and it shakes your core and then the opening crawl and you're just like yes i don't care what comes on the screen right now i just had this opening crawl and it's star wars and it's amazing and I liked it. I liked it a lot better than I liked The Phantom Menace and Attack of the Clones. Um, And even though I didn't love it, I liked it. But what I liked more was the memory I got from it of it being one of the first films I saw with my now husband. So we got to see Revenge of the Sith together and that was awesome and we were able to connect that way so that's cool and obviously that's the reason why you both got married because you both love revenge of the sith more than any other movie ever no (laughs) Uh, agree to disagree Uh, (laughs) he's also a lord of the rings fan so that we also were able to connect that way but no, he absolutely loved that I was a Star Wars fan. Okay, I'm going to go side Akbar because you're both Lords of the Rings. All of us are Lord of the yes. Rings fans, but you yes. two have mentioned yes. a few times. So I have to know because Lord of the Rings, you know, the three, they were great movies. No one's going to mm-hmm. dispute that. But then years later, they decide to do their own prequel, oh. The Hobbit. So I just want to know mm-hmm. very, very quickly, very quickly, how does The Hobbit compare to the Star Wars prequels in your eyes? Um. <laughs> I think it was a different situation because with 
George Lucas, he didn't let anyone inter intervene or interfere with his creations of the prequels. And I think if he allowed some people to help him in that process, it would have probably been a lot better um, because he he basically would not listen. Um, and that's one of the reasons why the original trilogy worked out is he had a beautiful editor and his wife and he actually would listen to, mm -hmm. to people and collaborate. With The Hobbit, it was Peter Jackson not being able to do anything that he wanted to do and basically being held hostage by Warner Brothers. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that's, that's what we feel in The Hobbit is basically him going, okay, I just have to do what the studio wants and I don't want it. And he did not have the passion or the heart that he put in the Lord of the Rings. I mean, that was a that was a love project, and I hate to say that, but that's all I could think of. I mean, it was it was just him, just so wanting this movie to come to life, and and working with Wingnut Productions and, and their design work, and mm -hmm. and just overseeing every little and detail. Weta. Yeah. And Weta, yeah, and Weta, and then mm -hmm. it's just. For The Hobbit, it, he just, he didn't have a choice. And they didn't treat the people that, that at New, Ze New Zealand right. Like every connection and wonderful memory that the filming the, the Lord of the Rings was completely tarnished by The Hobbit. Now, does The Hobbit tarnish my Lord of the Rings experience? No. <laughs> mm -mm. Like, because it doesn't feel... It does not have Peter Jackson's signature. It has um, studio mandatory yes. <laughs> yes. requirements on it. There are things that I I did enjoy yeah. about The Hobbit. Um, and I have to say, especially the first film, um, the fact that they made it a trilogy is just bonkers because the, the book is so small yeah. uh, comparatively. Yeah. And... The fact that they stretched uh, this butter over too much bread to give oh. a Lord of the Rings analogy. See what I did yes. there? Um, okay. Is just, ugh, it's grotesque to say the least. So uh, the, the first film, though, did make me excited. I was still hopeful after the first one. Um. You know, a Zog, everything else, like that stupid stuff aside, we didn't see Toriel yet. We didn't see Legolas. Um, now you're adding a whole new character, and now you're adding a character who, yeah, was alive and possibly around during the time of The Hobbit, but we never saw him, but you're going to add him in. Um, it's a shame. I felt the book was so bad beautiful for what it was and what the studio did to the to the film and it's and it's horrible too because the actors in the film were yes. wonderful yeah. i loved martin freeman as bilbo yeah um and i i loved luke evans as bard i mean everyone even thorin i mean they pretty much de-aged almost the entire dwarf clans but <laughs> because I felt that it worked it fit and but after that first film the the second and the third especially the third it was just like oh man my sales were deflated yeah. um that being said I feel that the hobbit probably stands in equal measure to me as revenge of the sith Interesting. The Hobbit as a okay. whole, yeah. I like as much as Revenge of the Sith. Um, it shows what can happen in both ends of the extreme. The director going all in on what he wants to do versus what a director is not able to do at all. And a studio has the biggest hand to play. And they're overplaying it. Um. 
it's a shame. But again, I don't, I don't dislike the franchise of, of Tolkien's universe as a, as a whole. Um, and especially now you're having the second age come into play with Amazon and, and the, the new uh, series that's being put out there. I'm still very excited to see that yeah, and absolutely. what they're going to do. Again, there's so, there's so much out there for everyone to, to like. And again, there are people out there who love the Hobbit and they love the character of Toriel and they love her relationship with not only Legolas, but they love it with Keely and that's <laughs> for them. And that's fine. And I don't, I don't dig on that. Let them have that. But I will, always have the fellowship of the ring the two towers and return of the return of the king and that was for me that was for emerson that was for so many of us i will never forget that time in my life no ever that's awesome. um yeah. it was absolutely uh, astounding um and it hit at such a moment where you're not an adolescent anymore. For me, I was becoming a young woman and I just graduated high school when Return of the King came out. Um, so it just felt, I will always love Star Wars, especially the original trilogy. Lord of the Rings was on another level. It was more mature. Um, not that Star Wars didn't have mature themes, obviously. Um, but it was more mature for me at the time. And I think that's why star Wars didn't leave me, but it was on the back burner I, I for that time. Wonderful description. Mm -hmm. Star Wars, the love for star Wars didn't leave. Well, mm -hmm. it's all in the same thread of an epic journey and a hero's quest. And I mm -hmm. think, I think star Wars started that love. Yes. I mean, I think for all of us, star Wars, um, allowed us to really love that epic storytelling, that myth. And mm -hmm. so it, it just, I, I yeah, I, I kind of think of what Tariel said of, why does it hurt so much? Because <laughs> it was real. Because it was real. Oh, my God. <laughs> the pain was real. Um, and that's how Who it wrote felt. this, Ryan Johnson? Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah. oh it, it was just, it was so sad. But yeah, I mean, it, and I think that's one of the reasons why it was the same reason that Revenge of the Sith was just a blip on my on my radar is because mm -hmm. I ate and uh, breathed Lord of the Rings. I mean, seriously, that commentary or extended edition was just played <laughs> like oh, yeah. nonstop in my room. Yeah. <laughs> like, I would listen to the actor's commentary, then the director's commentary. <laughs> mm -hmm. It was just, it was going nonstop, so. It was still fresh, too, even yes. though it was 2003 and Revenge of the Sith came out in 2005. Um, it was still so fresh enough where, and even though the internet was, was not anywhere near it is now, the role play community, and I was heavy into Lord of the Rings role play, the role play community was ginormous because everything was so fresh in everyone's mind um and yeah another reason why i fell away from from star wars and was heavy into lord of the rings is because of of that um but yeah it all started with with star wars it made it star wars allowed people to go yeah we we can do this we can adapt everyone's favorite fantasy book into this movie but what's great about star wars is it didn't come from a book it came from a man's mind mm -hmm. and i think that's what makes it so incredibly special well that man sold star wars <clears throat> he did and his company to disney did yeah. either of you have any strong feelings about that acquisition when it happened or were you kind of just so was it your dark times and you were too far gone in Star Wars to worry about <laughs> what was to come? Do you know? Do you know when he did that? Like when that? Two thousand twelve. Okay, um, I'm trying to remember what was going on in two thousand twelve. For me personally, I don't. I didn't even really see that. Um, personally, at that time, I was. Uh, 
like three years into my marriage and, you know, other stuff was going on. So I heard rumblings like, oh, George Lucas sold Lucasfilm to Disney. Like, I think I saw it on the news or something like that. And I was like, dang, good for him. Daddy Warbucks now. I mean, like, he's raking it. <laughs> and um, I, I didn't really think, I don't think I had time to think about what that meant for a lot of people. Um, cause I'm like, ah, I'm sure that sucks, but I got to worry about this thing over here right now. And that's what I did. I worried about this thing over here. If I probably sat and took the time to actually think about what that meant, not only to me, but for a lot of people, I would have been hurt by that because literally fans feel like he's selling out. Literally he's, he sold out. Um, I can see how that hurt many, how that would hurt many people. That being said, things have to grow and things have to adapt and you can't go back in time and change things. You can't go back in time and change the script for the prequel trilogy. I think he was deeply hurt by what happened with the prequel trilogy. Exactly. I think he also learned deeply with what happened with the prequel trilogy and went, you know what? Yeah, these are all still my ideas and still my concepts, but maybe I'm not the best person to take the reins anymore. I don't think anyone will ever truly know what was in his mind more than just dollar signs. I think if I were George Lucas, I would have been hesitant to keep going with this. And sure, you can say, oh, you know, uh, screw Kathleen Kennedy, Dave Filoni should head it up, or blah, 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 you know, whoever have you. Well, that's, that's all well and good. But I think it was a man who created this world and was just tired and didn't want to be in the spotlight like he was after the prequel trilogy. Mm -hmm. You go through a lot of dark times. I mean, look at what happened to Ahmed Best and Kelly Marie Tran. George Lucas went through that as well. There's this man who's held up on this pedestal. And then after the prequel trilogy, then he's like shot down more than a peg or two. Well, look at that, Ryan Johnson. Exactly. Yeah. That yeah. does something to someone's psyche. And I don't care if you're a man or a woman. So I don't blame him. And I can say this now also because, you know, I'm in my mid thirties and I certainly look at things differently than I did in my twenties or even as a, a young adult, but I can't blame the man for doing what he did no. and selling it to Disney. I just can't, I can't, I don't know what I would have done in that same situation, but I don't blame him. And things have to change. And he's not going to be around forever. And you look at, well, who do I want to take this over? And who do I trust with these stories? Or it could have just been about money. I don't think no one will ever truly know. I think I've been to the San Francisco, the Walt Disney Museum in San Francisco. And there's a quote mm -hmm. by George Lucas on there. And he says that, mm -hmm. uh, it's, and this is before the, the acquisition, all that. He mm -hmm. says that Star Wars is uh, sh should have been and always was a Disney film. And this is yeah. before he sold it, so I think I think he knew where he wanted to go with that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I mean, also, and I, I believe he donated the four billion dollars. I believe I could be wrong on that, but um, yeah. I I think it. I, I I've seen a lot of the interviews that he had right when he sold it. And I, I think it's pretty apparent that he was in deep hurt, almost like he wanted to to get rid of the pain. Mm -hmm. And I think we as fans need to learn a lesson. We are partly responsible for that. If, if you were in a dark day <laughs> over Lucas selling it to Disney, it's because we treated a man 
who created Star Wars, who created Indiana Jones, who created so many of our precious memories of our childhood and treated him like he was trash. I mean, and I think that for making a creative mistake, now, is he blameless? No, but I'm just saying toxic being toxic or hateful always has its consequences you reap what you sow and i just i think it should be a lesson like how we treat ryan johnson is is how we should and and all of these people who are these creative heads we need to remember that they're people too and they can make mistakes and to tell them what you think but treat them as humans. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I think George Lucas is an example of that. I didn't personally have a dark day when uh, George Lucas sold the rights because he wasn't going to do anything with them. And to me, it was like Star Wars is alive again and the stories are out of the vault. Uh, old Scrooge McDuck <laughs> let the gold out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that's yeah. That's how I felt. I... And Star Wars um, started becoming live for me again. My my nieces and nephews were born, and they had a, a huge Star Wars fandom going on in that household. So I was able to experience Star Wars through their eyes and the prequels through their eyes. And they introduced me to the Clone Wars and things of that nature. So to me, it, it was being – it was – it was their time for a new story for their generation. Mm-hmm. And that's exactly what myths are. They recycle when the culture needs them. And we as the world are having another dark period of time. Just like in the 80s and the 70s when George Lucas first created Star Wars, the movies were dark and uh, fearful and distrusting and gritty. Well, we're having that now as much as i love the superhero movies and things of that nature even superman (laughs) got became dark and gritty and you can debate that as long as the uh the moon shines but it's just we need a story of hope we need a story for this generation and how beautiful for star wars to to live again and be part of uh this this new crop of fans and that's what I love like to me I don't think we should card hold people like I love the sequel trilogy and the original trilogy I'm not a big fan of the prequels I'm still a Star Wars fan but I don't look upon a prequel fan and go you're not a true fan (laughs) only true fans love the original trilogy or something of that nature and I think we need to realize that everyone is on their own journey of fandom and they're here now <laughs> and it doesn't yes. matter how they got here mm-hmm. they want to be part of the discussion and we can all like what we like and don't like and still talk and still share this universe that means so much to us and that's the community of storytelling that's what storytelling is for um to talk and discuss and share the characters and the stories that you love that's how stories have continued throughout time and it's just sad and it's sad it's just sad to me that people feel like they can't allow others to enjoy what they personally don't like and so they they fling those labels like sjw and um all of these these labels that they like to stick on something so they can reject it when it's just an issue of They don't like it. And if you don't like the sequel trilogy, that is perfectly fine. (laughs) But allow people who do to enjoy it. Just like I hated watching the prequels with my nephews and nieces. Like it was like pulling teeth. (laughs) (laughs) To see the joy that it brought on their faces, I could not make fun of Jar Jar Binks. And although how much I wanted to... Jar Jar Binks was hysterical to them and it should be left. <laughs> it should be where they get to enjoy Star Wars and what star, how Star Wars became 
part of their of their childhood too. Sorry, I rambled on on that, but I think that's so important to this community is to it to realize there are other people, um, and just incl- be inclusive of the Star Wars community again. Bring back, bring back the love. Oh my gosh, I can't believe I said that. But there hope, I go. Hope you knew what you were getting into, James. Oh uh, yeah. Okay. Please you, you, edit that thing. <laughs> oh, that's not. I'm not touching that. Nope. That's oh all gold, gosh. Jerry. Go. You bring up a great point, though. Is everybody has this mindset of, that's not my Star Wars, or yeah. this is my Star Wars. But Star Wars isn't yours, and it's not mine. Right. It's not. There's. Right. It's all of ours, and we all have mm-hmm. a piece of it. And you can like the Clone Wars the best. You can like Rebels the best. You know, Resistance, Droids, Ewoks, right. whatever. Gun. They could all. That is your Star Wars. Take it. Love it. Obsess yes. over it. Start a YouTube channel. Start a podcast. Do whatever you want with it, uh, and don't piss on somebody else because they like a part of it that maybe you don't agree with yeah which now we're going to wrap things up because (laughs) we're going to get to the part i broke it i broke everything you broke everything i just want to say one more thing though i want to say one more thing about that before we wrap it well i wanted to get into the part that that people will will pee all over and that's raylo but okay go on right um well we won't pee all no not you because that's our bread and butter how does that uh so i just we're all, I look at us as like, oh, it's not my Star Wars, it's not my Star Wars. Well, it's everyone's Star Wars. I feel we are all stewards yeah. of Star Wars. And we owe it to everyone in the fandom now and everyone who is going to be, whether it's a nephew or a niece or a younger brother or sister or whoever have you, we owe it to people to be positive and go, you know what? I didn't like that part, but tell me what you liked about it. And maybe I'll look at it with different eyes. You know, if you come into it with a healthy mentality, then that just, the negativity slips away. Just like you said at the beginning, James, where it's not like, it's not hard to block out the negativity that is swirling around us when all we do is stay positive. Um, And that's not to say none of us get down about, you know, content creating and what we're doing, but it is pretty easy to tune out the negativity when you allow people to come into this part of the community and fellowship together. It's very easy for things to negative things to fall, excuse me, to fall away. But that's what being a steward is all about. We have to be the stewards for the younger generation and even for the people, the generations that we're in period. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Raylo. All right. So, (laughs) You're, you're both you're both like Lord of the Rings, yay! Second breakfast, and you're all having oh a great God. time. Uh, and then and then George Lucas is like, oh, everyone's into Lord of the Rings. I can't do this anymore. He sells he sells Star Wars, he sells Lucasfilm, he sells Star Wars. That's Kathleen basically Kennedy, it. That's what happened. That's exactly why. Uh, and then and then Kathy, he, he appoints Kathleen Kennedy as the head of, of Lucasfilm, and um, and they say, okay, we're going to make a movie. Uh, in three years, in 2015. Can I just point out, yeah. George Lucas appointed a woman. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So, who had the chops? I, we're, we were talking so much about female directors and female writers. Can we talk about female producers and Kathy Kay and her chops? I mean, that is a woman who certainly earned her place at the top of Lucasfilm. Whether you like her or not, whether you disagree with George's decision, she earned her place there. Yeah. She has credentials and more. So just throwing that out there, he picked a woman, which is very, very cool. And also when that happened, not one person complained about it. So yep, exactly. So yeah. Exactly. So there you go. They don't complain until the sequel trilogy comes out. Then let's tar and feather her. And then, and then (laughs) Disney and Kathleen Kennedy understood why George Lucas sold. (laughs) 
Yeah. <laughs> They're like, oh, we get it now. Yeah. This, this, this like, is oh, toxic. Oh, all because of the fans. Yeah. <laughs> but it's like, John. We should bear some. Sorry, to bear some responsibility. Let's not do it again. I just don't want Star Wars to die again. That was just too painful for me. It's never, it's don't never worry, going to. We always have Lord of the Rings. Yeah, you have Lord of the Rings. <laughs> Disney will open up a Lord of the Rings land, and we'll all go there oh and wait gosh. three hours to build oh, a Sting. Will never oh. any of that to Disney. Why does it hurt so much? <laughs> So 2015 okay. comes. 2015 yeah. comes. The Force Awakens is released. Now, I got to ask. You both enjoyed the original trilogy, but the prequels left a stain. Oh, sure. Yeah. And then you're obsessed with Lord of the Rings, yada, yada, yada. <laughs> what, was your exci- what were your excitements like heading into The Force Awakens? I was giddy. Me too. I saw that trailer and I died. Was it? I- was it because was, it didn't remind? Sorry, was it because it didn't remind you of of the prequels? Because it took you back it to the originals. It didn't look like the prequels. No. It didn't feel like it felt watching the prequels or even the prequel trailers. And don't get me wrong, like I felt the prequel trailers were pretty dope. Like I did get semi excited about the films after watching those trailers. But seeing the Force Awakens trailer, and I said it in my little survey questionnaire, is that literally was the spark. Pun intended. I mean, that was the spark that I needed to jump into this fandom again. And I remember seeing it opening night with the hubs. And afterwards, I went out of that theater and I went, that felt like a Star Wars film. Yeah. That felt like, like, I mean, J.J. knew that was a love letter. That was a love letter to Star Wars. And I said, I looked at him and I was like, oh, and Kylo Ren and Rey are getting together. And he's like, yeah, yeah they are. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, and the, Hubs, and the Hubs is a casual Star Wars fan. I mean, he loves Star Wars, but I'm like, he's way not into it like, like I am now. Um, and, but he saw it. He saw it right right from the beginning like they're totally getting together i mean there's so much chemistry and i can't wait to see what happens in the last jedi and you know we come out of last jedi saying like oh my god we were right um but uh, the the force awakens i love that it mirrored the ot because it's for a new generation um, but I felt like a kid again. I felt like I was seven years old in my living room watching A New Hope. Um, and I didn't hate it. I loved it. Um, I felt it had so much more depth too. And just that I'm such a J.J. Abrams fan in general, and I loved what he did to Star Trek. I love... Um, I was a fan of his ever since Felicity, and we've talked about that on our own channel. Um, and the music, again, John Williams coming in clutch. Uh, <laughs> it's just everything about it I loved. It was it was so wonderful to me. And I didn't it, I didn't get online and like search for things after that. I saw it you know, probably once or twice more in the theater. Um, But I didn't get super, super deep into it until The Last Jedi. But the spark was there. It was lit. It it only propelled me into The Last Jedi even more, I think. The spark was lit when Mm -hmm. I saw that trailer and... I heard Harrison Ford say Chewie we're home and yes. I lost it. Yes. I mean that that trailer, that first official trailer, my tears were running down my cheeks when I heard yeah. Harrison Ford say that line. Mm-hmm. It to me it was yeah, I, I was giddy too. And I love The Force Awakens. Um I have 
very little criticism for it because yeah. it, it was just so nostalgic. And I was next to I was next to a, a woman. She looked about 60 years old and she was with her her angsty teenage grandson. <laughs> And like during the uh, resistance fight on Takadana, all of a sudden, like when Poe came in, she just like applauded and cheered like she was a little girl. And the angsty teenager looked at her like, you are so embarrassing me, Granny. But I was like, I am supporting this woman. And we both cheered like little girls and I didn't care. So, I mean, it was like situations, it was things like that. There was just a joy in that theater. Um, and it was palpable and you could feel it. It captured some of that Star Wars magic. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes, it did. I yeah. felt like the magic was back. Yeah. Definitely. And then, of course, that led to The Last Jedi, which <laughs> leads to Girls with Sabres. If nothing else, that's what The Last Jedi gave us, was your YouTube channel. Yeah, everyone should be thankful. Like, yeah. they, like our first video dropped June 25th of yeah. 2018, and that should be a worldwide Thanksgiving day. We will all celebrate. We'll toast. And yep. we will uh, we'll exchange presents. High yep. end, high end though. I want just the best. Oh yeah, totally. Like I, twenty five bucks and up. Like, yeah. No, like definitely. dollar store drivel. No, yeah. but like under fifty though. Like somewhere between. <laughs> somewhere oh, between okay. there. I yeah. got you. It's like somewhere between there. High end, but not. Yeah. Like, like end. we don't have to prove anything to anybody. We, we'll, you know, this is it'll be but great. Make, make it worth it. You yeah. Know? Also, I mean, uh, also Canadian dollars. So like five to ten American. Like that's the that's how we'll do. <laughs> Then I'm definitely in. <laughs> awesome. All right. Right before we leave, I just want to know. Sorry. Right before we leave, I just want to know, of all the sequel trilogy trailers that we've gotten so far, which have been your favorite? As much as I love The Last Jedi, because I love that music and the story it tells, I will have to say my favorite was the second one for The Force Awakens. When you have Luke's voice from the return of the Jedi, when he talks to Leia about how she is his sister and she has the force too. I love that trailer. When you hear him say, um, the force is strong with my family. My father has it. I have it. You have that too. And you see that generational pass down and what I love about that is that is even alluding to Ben Solo's return of the one that has it is Ben <laughs> you know my father has it I have it my sister has it you have that power too and that trailer has become even more important to me and still we have that iconic wonderful line of Chewie or home and I believe Ben Solo is going to say that on the Falcon <laughs> Chewie we're home or something like that or because, Ray we're home yes or something of that nature because this is all about the prodigal son coming home this is about the Solo Skywalker family and for if this now I think it's debatable if the Solo saga will end but we know the Skywalker saga will end in order for Anakin's quest to be fulfilled, his, his grandson must survive and, and end up happily, in my opinion. As I, as I love Raylo, Raylo is my bread and butter. Raylo is uh, basically all that we have thought about for two years. <laughs> well, not that. all that we've thought about, but it's yeah. been a big chunk. But if I had to choose between Raylo and Bendemption, it would be Bendemption mm -hmm. because um, that family started us on this journey. And I want to see Ben Solo on his father's ship um, with his grandfather's lightsaber, just like it should have been. I want restoration and redemption for that family. I have to say it's a tie for me between the Last Jedi trailer and the Rise of Skywalker teaser. 
with the last Jedi trailer, you had Ray's theme, Kylo's theme, and the Force theme all swirling around together. Yes. Oh. And the fact that at the end, and even talking about it gives me full body chills, Ray going, I just want somebody to show me my place. Oh. And you have Kylo Ren sticking his hand out, which obviously is, <gasps> um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Glory, um, hallelujah. Sure, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's an illusion. I mean, it's, it didn't happen that way, but still, that's just Ryan Johnson going, uh, and he's like touching his nose, like, da da da. It is what it is. I mean, it was phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. And I, f- I got those same chills watching. The Rise of Skywalker. Also, because we have, we're waiting with bated breath during Celebration and watching Celebration and, you know, talking to the people who are there. We're, I'm racing home from work. I mean, I literally took a half day <laughs> driving home and this trailer drops. And, like, I knew it was going to drop when I was driving home. I pull over, watch <laughs> it, and I'm like, how am I going to drive home? Oh, my God, we got to do a live stream. Oh, like, I'm trying to analyze. I'm trying to drive. I'm tr- like, call. I'm talk. I had to stop and get cat food because my cat, my cats were literally out of cat food. So I stopped. I found the <laughs> Briars Raylo ice cream. I'm like, oh, my God, today is the day. I get the Raylo ice cream. I get back home, jump on the live stream. I mean, so, but when you have Palpatine's laugh at the end, with the new title popping up, Lord have mercy. I mean, <laughs> they knew exactly what they were doing. I can't wait for the full trailer. Um, but right now it's a tie between Last Jedi and the Trust teaser. I mean. You have to mention when Kylo got that oh, guy down. Kyle drives the Knight of Ren into the ground. That is, yeah, that that's is, my favorite that is, part. Yeah, that, forget Palpatine. <laughs> <laughs> that's the scene i watch over and over again <laughs> it's so beautiful so good so good all right we do a segment on the rebel scum podcast called never tell me the odds right before we leave never tell me the odds is Raylo going to come to fruition in rise of skywalker i don't even have to ask that question go over to the girls with sabers youtube channel <laughs> and you will find out the answer to that one all the time yes. your videos are great uh th- they, they're not it's not a typical youtube channel from what i watch usually i watch uh, myself and no, i watch oh, well, tra- no, it's in depth it's amazing uh check out the patreon as well um to get the stuff early and you do special live streams as well for your patreon supporters yep. also. we just did our first one uh, a couple days ago and it was awesome um it's it's so great with our live streams on youtube uh, as fun as they are, as awesome as they are, and, and we are always like, oh, we should only go an hour. Like, we average two-hour live streams. <laughs> and the comment section goes so quick. Um, oh, yeah. So many questions. And, you know, we're very fortunate to get a lot of super chats in those. And, of course, we have to answer all those questions. Um, those are at the top of the list. With the, It's just a lot going on. With the Patreon live stream it's a lot more intimate and it was just very relaxed. We could hit everyone's question. Um, It's awesome. It's a way more intimate setting and we're able to take care of them a little bit more, which, which feels good. I feel like we're not putting a question on the back burner and forgetting about it. And, you know, Oh, well, you know, and then apologizing afterwards, like, Oh, I'm sorry. We'll, we'll get you next time. Um, it was a lot of it was a lot of fun. All right, so look for them online, Girls with Sabers. Thank you so much for joining me on the Outland uh, on the Outlander Club podcast. You are so welcome. Thank you for having us. Yes, thank you, James, mm-hmm. very much. Hey, scumbags! Thanks for watching. Don't forget to give us a thumbs up on our video. As always, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, Rebel Scum Podcast, for all the latest videos.